Uh, so welcome back for another Friday evening, UK time anyway, Friday evening Facebook Live. I'm Paul Ducklin from Sophos Naked Security and the good news is that although today's topic sounds kind of scary, it's probably something that either you're already protected against or if you're working from home you're not at too much risk of. But let's go into it because it's been the absolutely huge story of the week. Uh, as you can see today's, today's topic uh, from the title, Ping of Death, Are You At Risk? Now, you've probably heard of that term, ping of death, if you, uh, if you want to search for the exact uh, vulnerability by its official uh, MITRE vulnerability ID, it's the much less catchy CVE-2020-16898. That's the official name of the bug. That's where you'll find information about it under that tag, 16898, on Microsoft's own website. And it was one of numerous bugs that was fixed in this month's Patch Tuesday. So if you patched on Tuesday or any time between Tuesday and today with the latest Microsoft updates, then you are not at risk of this. So you can stand down from Blue Alert. And I say Blue Alert as a kind of a joke because the most likely reason that you would notice that somebody had attacked you by this bug would be something like this. Now, unfortunately, the lighting I discovered just before I started, you can see in the reflection that somehow it gets the colour right. That's meant to be a blue screen of... That's meant to be a blue screen of death recorded from Windows on an Android phone. Um, so, unfortunately, that's what you're likely to see if you're, on a, if you're on a Windows system and you get attacked by this bug. In other words, because of the nature of the bug, it doesn't just crash an app on your computer. It doesn't just crash a critical app on your computer, it crashes the kernel. So let's very quickly look at what this bug is, how it came about, and what you can do about it if you haven't patched, or you're in an office network and you like to delay your patches a little bit, or your IT team won't be getting together, say, until next week to actually sort out this month's patches. I know that companies are trying to do patches, Windows patches, much faster these days, because we know that in many cases, the sooner you move, the more you're, the quicker you're ahead of the crooks. And we know particularly if there are zero day problems where the crooks find the bug first, which is not what happened here as far as we can see, then the faster you move, the less time they've got to get, the, the less time they've had to be after you already. But we also recognize that sometimes it's difficult to do it on the Tuesday or on the Wednesday. A, you want to do some testing, and B, you need a time where you can have your IT team together and you've given users plenty of warning and they kind of know what disruptions may or may not be about. So the reason it's got the nickname Ping of Death is that it relates to a thing called ICMP. So let's go into quickly what that is. You've probably heard of TCP IP. It's the kind of generic term, the metonym, if you like, for modern internet networking. And it's short for Transmission Control Protocol over the Internet Protocol. Now, in fact, TCP, that's what we call a connection a connection based system. It's what your web browser does when it connects to a web server. It opens a connection, which is a little bit like sort of making a phone call, waiting for the other end to answer. Hello, am I speaking to Janice? Yes, you are. Excellent. It's Paul on this end. Great, let's go ahead and converse. And you can have silent bits in the conversation. You can pick up the conversation where you left off. You've got a connection and both ends can talk to each other at will. That's TCP. One level down you get UDP, User Datagram Protocol, what's called a connectionless protocol. And that's where you just take packets, you decide where you want to send them, you sling the packets across the network, and you don't get any acknowledgement that the other end answered. You don't get a continuous connection where you can send and receive data and keep the connection open for, for seconds or minutes or hours or even days, like you can with TCP. But as the name suggests, UDP is basically where you take some data and you, by intention, send it presumably to a process that's running at the other end. So the good examples of where you don't really need a response, but you just want to send data and you hope that someone at the other end is listening might be system logging, where you send the data. If it doesn't arrive, you don't want to hold up your system until the logs arrive. You just want to say, here's something I'm telling you about it. If you wish to receive the data, you can. And one level below that even is this ICMP. And most people kind of aren't aware that it's even there. So you've probably heard of TCP for things like web browsing, UDP for things like system logging and DNS, but ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol, 
It's a very low level, very simple way of sending packets to another computer, just or a router, so that it can respond and tell you something about the network or the computer, just like the name suggests. So if, ever, if you've ever used the command ping, where you ping a computer and it just sends a reply to say, yep, I'm alive, that's using ICMP. And the idea is you don't really intend to send any data. You do have data in a ping packet. You can put whatever data in there you like. Uh, the ping program I use, I think, puts data 01, 02, 03, 04, 05 for however many bytes. You can put the rain in Spain falls mainly in the plane, if you like. And the idea is, if the other end is alive and it's listening to your packets, it just sends a reply with the same data in, and it's just a simple way of like a ping and a pong that comes back. Another ICMP message, uh, that this number three, message number three, you may have seen this, destination or host unreachable. So that's when you're trying to send a packet, you get as far as your router and your router goes, you know, you're wasting your time. So it sends a message back to your networking subsystem. So most of the time, these ICMP messages are just your computer talking to other computers as a way of deciding, is the other end alive? So you don't intend to send data or receive data or download web pages or exchange messages or have a chat or anything. It's just simply a control message that helps the network operate. So you kind of take this whole ICMP thing for granted. And unfortunately, the bug that Microsoft discovered and patched was a bug in the way that these ICMP packets are handled for IPv6. Now, most of us will be using IPv4. That's where we have our IP addresses, internet numbers that are something like 172.16.13.11, something like that. Four 8-bit numbers making up 32 bits. Uh, IPv6 is the kind of next generation of internet addresses, obviously with, with four bytes. You can only have an absolute maximum of 2 to the power of 32 or 4 billion devices numbered on the internet. We never thought we'd run out, but of course with Internet of Things and every device, every light bulb in the world needing an IP number, we now have IPv6 which uses 128-bit 16-byte numbers and most computer systems that you're running these days, for example, you've got a default Windows installation, even if you don't think you're using IPv6, it's almost certainly enabled. So somebody else on the network who's got access to the same wireless or wired network as you could send you ICMP IPv6, that's quite a mouthful, packets, and your computer will probably respond, even if you're not aware of it, even if you don't think you need it. And it turns out that there's a special, in these... IPv6 control packets, there's a special field where you can put in some optional data and that's the bit that wasn't tested very well. And it turns out, uh, I'm not going to go into details of exactly how, but it turns out that if that in this optional field that you can put, not in old school ping packets, but in new school ones, there's an optional field that you can put in there that is a variable size and if you deliberately make it bigger than it's supposed to be and poke it at another Windows computer on your network, then what will probably happen is that you'll get that blue screen of death. And the reason is it's a, what's a very old style of bug. You'd think all these are out of Windows now. It's what's called the stack buffer overflow. The system is expecting, let's say, that much data, but you send it, or it's expecting that much data and you send it that much instead. It overwrites memory it's not supposed to have access to, it throws the program off its guard, and the program crashes. Unfortunately, the bit of software that deals with the, these ICMP messages on a Windows system, this is Windows 10 or Windows Server 2019, is a program called tcpip.sys. And if you know your Windows program names, you'll know that .sys files aren't regular programs or applications, they're kernel drivers. So normally if you crash an exe file or a DLL or something like that, something that runs as a user program, then that's bad, but the program will be closed down and it can start up again and your system will generally maintain its integrity and stay running. Unfortunately, if you crash a kernel program, that's when you get the blue screen of death image and your system basically, because if the kernel's corrupted, you can't just reload it because it will be the corrupt kernel that will be responsible for loading the new kernel. That could go terribly wrong. So when you get a blue screen of death, basically what it means is shut down, reboot, start the system again. Now in theory, this bug, because it means you're basically poking a knitting needle into this network component in the kernel, in tcpip.sys, 
and you're causing it to run, use memory incorrectly and crash the system. In theory, with a lot of clever care, a crook might be able to get what's called remote code execution. So you don't just poke in something dangerous that causes the program, the kernel, to crash. You cause the kernel to crash in a way that you get control and you get to run your own software code. Now, 10 or 20 years ago, when you when if you were to discover a stack buffer overflow in Windows in a programmer in the kernel, it was almost guaranteed, at least 20 years ago, almost guaranteed that you would be able to use that to take over the remote system and implant malware, and possibly, if there's a network command involved, possibly or even probably turn it into a computer virus or a worm by using the system you just broke into to break into the next one and the next one and the next one and so on. So those of you with long memories may remember things like Code Red or SQL Slammer, which did exactly that, broke into a computer, stuck some malicious code in memory, took over execution, scanned the next computer and the next one on the next one. These things spread all over the world very, very quickly. So in theory, this bug could be used for that. However, the good news is that at least since Windows XP Service Pack 3 and with increasing deftness from that time on, Microsoft has added more and more protections to Windows. So even if someone makes an elementary bug like this buffer overflow, it's much, much, much harder for an attacker to abuse it in what you might call a structured way. So as far as we can see at the moment, uh, our the SOPHOS offensive security team, that's that's the security that's offensive, not the team, and it's offensive as the opposite of defense, not the opposite of polite. They came up with a proof of concept that showed that they can generate ping packets that instantly crash another computer on the network, but they were unable to find a way in which they could actually take control of it. So the good news is that it looks as though the crooks haven't got there yet. So if you've patched, this bug goes away on your Windows 10 or your Windows Server 29 team systems and you don't have to worry about it anymore. So patching is your first lifeline. We always say patch early, patch often. I know that not everybody agrees with that. In this case, for this particular bug, I strongly recommend it because even though nobody knows how to exploit this yet to take over your computer, you can bet your boots that somebody is looking to try and do so. So the sooner you patch, the bigger the waste of time their effort is trying to break into your computer using this trick because you neutralize it entirely. If you can't patch yet or you're unwilling to do so, there are a couple of things you could do on your Windows system. Now, if you're at home, you might decide not to worry too much because if you have a home router, most home routers, you know, they have a whole local network behind them. So if someone from outside on the internet pings your network, the router doesn't know where that ping packet is supposed to go. So the only thing generally on the average home network that could respond to pings, if it's enabled, is the router. And it doesn't pass those ping packets through. So on a home network, you're probably not at risk from someone outside. But if you're in a shared student house, for example, or you're sharing a network, people you don't know too well, or people have been in lockdown with you for so long that they kind of think that crashing your computer could be an absolutely cool and amazing thing to do, then um, this workaround, and you haven't patched this workaround, maybe for you. So there are two things you can do. One is if you're absolutely certain that you are not using IPv6 on your network, and some people won't be, you can turn it off. Now, some people say, oh, don't do that because it's the future of networking, and if you turn it off, you'll be... We're not saying you turn it... You... We're not saying that you have to disavow it and never use it ever. But there is a tick box in Windows network settings that actually makes it easy for you to turn it off temporarily and then the buggy part of the system will not be responding to requests. This bug will be neutralized. Uh, and to do that, you need to go to, uh, on, on my computer, I tested it. You go to settings, uh, network and sharing center. Then you pick your network. Mine's just imaginary called Ethernet. Click on Ethernet, properties, and in the list, you'll see a load of tick boxes. And you'll see IPv4, that will be on. IPv6 by default will be turned on even if you're not using it. If you turn it off, that will disable it and the buggy part of the system will no longer be listening for requests. So it will no, you, it will no longer be probable or probable via this bug. The other thing you can do if you do want to leave IPv6 turned on, there's a, the bug is in a particular part of the code that deals with a thing, I won't go into this in detail, called RDNSS. You, 
Not even, even a four-letter acronym wasn't enough, they needed five. It's short for Recursive DNS Server, or something like that. And it's just a way of giving some hints in a, in a ICMP IPv6 request. Uh, generally speaking, it doesn't matter if, you, if you're not listening out for those. And Microsoft has a way, you can look at it on its website, it's one command line you have to type in, which will turn off that optional feature. So IPv6 will still work, it probably, you probably won't notice any difference, and after you've patched, it's one line of code, again, to go and turn this back on. So there are two workarounds for this, folks. Um, if you haven't patched yet, I do recommend you apply one of them, because, like I said, the nature of this bug, the fact that anybody who can send a ping packet to your computer, can crash your computer at will, and maybe, just maybe, might be able to find out a way to unleash a worm like Code Red or SQL Slammer on the world. It's worth you blocking off your system so you can't be attacked yourself or, in turn, end up attacking anybody else. And even if all they can do is crash systems on your network at will, you can still see that's a pretty bad thing to happen. Because you imagine if, if, if a person who simply has access to your network, they don't have any logins, they don't have any usernames or any passwords, but they do know all the IP numbers of your com the computers on your network, if they can ping your computers to death one at a time, then that's very, very disruptive. They can take out a server, and just when you think you're bringing it back up, maybe it takes a couple of minutes to reboot, hey, they can crash it again. So although in the old days that used to be considered quite a joke, ha, 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 I crashed your computer, gotcha, it could be used for malevolence, and if you patch against this, basically you're completely ahead of the game, and there's no way that anybody can use this attack against you. So, just to recap, patch early, patch often. If you've patched against this CV 2020-16898, then you don't need to worry about anything that I've said today. If you haven't patched yet, there are two things you can do on a Windows 10 or a Windows Server 2019 computer, particularly if on a network that you share with other people and you're not quite sure who, the, who those people might be, uh, you can either turn off IPv6 or you can go to the Microsoft support page for this particular bug and they'll give you a command that will basically neutralize the bug temporarily and after you patch, it's a little feature that you can turn back on. And my understanding is that by turning it off, you don't really lose any functionality that you'll need and you probably won't even notice. So that's what a ping of death is. It's an embarrassing look for Microsoft, obviously, because it's, it's a very old school type of bug, right? Oh, a stack buffer overflow. Surely they've got all of those out of the kernel by now. But the good news is, even though they haven't, there are so many mitigations in Windows these days, in Windows software, such as checking that the stack buffer hasn't been damaged before you utilize it, making the stack non-executable, randomizing where things go in memory so that crooks can't easily guess what to do where and so forth, that it's our supposition that for somebody to exploit this, they'd either have to spend an awful lot of time or be incredibly lucky. And they haven't done it yet, and it's already several days later than the patch came out, so if you patch, you'll be ahead of the game. So thanks for listening, everybody, and until next time, stay secure.